Hello everyone. Um, <laughs> my name is Amanda. I am happy to welcome you all here today. Um, and I am happy to uh, start the program for this chat time as well. Um, yes, and today's chat time is it's titled Climate Tasks for Cultural Centers. Um, and we were excited to, that this will be our 28th chat time and our second chat time to use the round table format, which means that following the presentation, we will have an open group discussion led by the members of our round table. I would like to welcome all three members of our round table today. First, we have Ms. Chulamani Chatsuan, a CHA advisor and former senior foreign ministry official, um, including as Thai ambassador to Sri Lanka and deputy permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We have Ms. Momo Nguyen, vice chairperson of the Southeast Asian Cultural Heritage Alliance, being CHA, um, an architect and the founder of the Yangon Heritage Trust. And Dr. Ivan Hanares, CHA director of the Philippines and chairperson of the Heritage Conservation Society, among many other titles as a heritage conservation expert. Um, I want to welcome you all and our roundtable members. Thank you for being here. And I now would like to ask Dr. Ivan as well to welcome you all. Good morning to uh, everyone, to our speaker, uh, the uh, moderator and the audience. Uh, my name is Dr. Ivan Henares. I am the uh, CICHA Director for the Philippines, as well as Chairperson of the Heritage Conservation Society of the Philippines. Chat time with CICHA is one of our current activities. Cha is tea, so it is a tea time talk. We organize this once a month on Saturdays. Each year, we have a new theme for our chat time talks, and we are happy to announce that this episode of Cha Time is our first under the new theme from Traditions to Innovations, Asian Wisdom and Climate Action. Under this theme, we will invite speakers from across Asia to speak to the applications of Asian cultural wisdoms under a wide range of topics applying to climate action. We are also transitioning from our previous format of a presentation with a Q&A to a shorter presentation from our speakers featuring a more open roundtable discussion. The presentation will be about 20 to 30 minutes followed by an activity and roundtable discussion for 45 minutes up to an hour. Today is our 28th episode of Chat Time on the topic Climate Tasks for Cultural Centers. This talk will be led by Mr. Purim Jungham. Purim is a Thai scholar studying informal science learning in the United States. He received his master's in museum studies from the University of Washington and is continuing his work on community-based environmental learning and action at Oregon State University. Purim has been exploring the ways cultural centers like museums lead community participation in conversation about complex issues like climate change. Our current activities include the Cultural Heritage Man Management Clinic, a program in which we have started to extend our network of expertise to share with different cities across Southeast Asia. We have an upcoming cultural heritage management clinic at the end of this month from February 27 to 29 in Songkla, Thailand. So thank you very much to uh, everyone for joining us today. Thank you very much, Purim, as well. Without further ado, I would like to uh, invite Purim to take the stage. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Ivan. And uh, I am gonna show my slide now.
and hopefully y'all can see it. All right, how does it look? Okay, um, so, um, so the guiding question for today's presentation is, what has culture got to do with climate change? And hopefully you all are here because you ask yourself that very question as well. Um, and maybe you agree that there's, there's some connection between culture and climate change, but uh, not entirely sure what that connection is. Um, and by the end of this presentation, I hope that I can illuminate something, maybe a new idea or set you on a path of action. Um, if you have any question at any point throughout this presentation, I really encourage you to write it down somewhere um, because we might be able to get to it at the end. Um, but before I begin my presentation, let's define some terms so that we have a shared understanding uh, when I mentioned them. Uh, what is culture? So uh, what is the first thing you did today when you when you woke up? Um, would you consider that your culture? Why and why not? Um, so I really want you to think about this. So let's maybe take a 10 seconds to think about what you did this morning and would that, uh, would, is that a part of your culture or not? Um, and I'm gonna keep the time now. If you can write it out, that's perfect. Um, I love that we have a chance to do some reflection like this. So um, let's start the clock and yeah. All right, so that's 10 seconds. Did I say 10 minutes? I think I said 10 minutes. I mean, 10 seconds, sorry. Um, but <laughs> anyway, so I'm sure that people in this Zoom meeting are pretty familiar with the with the word culture, right? Um, but it's kind of one of those words that it's used so much, but people have a trouble defining it. So this is how I define it. And I don't remember which anthropology class I attended when I saw this equation written large on the screen uh, in front of the, the classroom. Um, but this equation stayed with me because this makes sense, right? Um, culture is a certain group of people living in a certain place in time. And some even think of culture in terms of time periods. Culture in the past, we call them tradition, right? And culture of the present time, sometimes we call them customs or common sense. Um, rarely, I would see people defy culture in terms of the future. But since our topic today is climate change, I think it's really important that we talk about the future. So what do you call, what do you call cultures that remain after you leave this planet? What is, what is culture in the future is called? Now, personally, I call it legacy. We leave our cultural legacies for future generations. Now, another term that I'll be um, throwing around a lot, it's cultural center. Uh, I titled this presentation, Cultural Task for Cultural Centers After All. So what are they really? A quick Wikipedia search told me that a cultural center is an organization, a building, a complex that promotes culture and art. So here's some examples of cultural centers that come to my mind. Uh, museums, obviously, because I have a background in museum studies, I think of them as um, the, uh, the, it's the first thing that comes to mind when I think about cultural uh, centers. But when I say museum, I also include a cultural heritage society, like the Siam Society as well. Now, university are where cultural knowledge is studied and sometimes produce. Maybe universities have the outreach program. Um, when you bring a new knowledge to a place and you try to change the people, uh, action and behavior, isn't that uh, changing the culture of that place too, right? Um, another example of cultural center is the worship places. Now, when you think about 
how depressing and anxiety inducing climate change is, a place where you can find your peace. It's extremely important. And I, I like to add a cultural leader based on my research and uh, personal experiences. Um, one person or a small group, a small number of people can have a lot of cultural power that can inspire a lot of cultural action. So when I say cultural center today, I mean these four categories, right? But still question remained, what is a cultural center like these examples has got to do with climate change? Now, we are about to embark on a journey to talk about climate change. This can be a very sensitive topic, um, but I think we all agree that it's important to talk about it, right? And I don't know about you, but I rather hear someone's idea when I know where they're coming from. Um, right now, you only know a few things about me. You know that I'm a student. You know that I study climate education. But who am I really? And why am I talking to you? Well, let me introduce myself a little bit. I grew up in a rural town called Nan in northern part of Thailand. We are known for our slow life culture and um, a lot of natural places. My childhood home it's actually was actually less than five minute walk to a rice field. Now, increasingly, I heard story after story of how hard it was to farm rice because of the extreme drought, droughts. Um, but since uh, where I live wasn't enduring a record breaking heat or threatened by sea level rise. Uh, so it took me a while to realize that I was impacted by climate change. I understand better now how the impact of climate change can be, uh, can take many forms, right? Um, and because we are so connected as a globe, climate change is a problem for everyone, no matter where it impacts. So now that I'm a scholar, three things that motivate me in my research are climate justice, community science, and youth empowerment. I am looking at the intersection of these three spheres and exploring for potential sustainable sustainable climate action. Now, I am an educator first, but I also strive to become an ad advocate for underserved communities. I want to help them realize the problem and empower them to find their solution. Uh, now, it's time. So let's set the scene. How exactly is climate change affecting people in Southeast Asia region? Uh, this visualization shows the world map if the size of each country really represents the actual land area. So as you can see here, African continent is a lot bigger than, than we remember seeing it on the world map, isn't it? Hmm. I wonder why. So. Um, we can go into the whole agenda and propaganda of creating a world map, but that's not what we're doing today. So this is another map that uh, show what it will look like if the size of the country represents the country's wealth. So you can see that the Europe uh, region and the America, North American region are pretty big on the map and then the China and India too, right? Now, this is what a world map will look like if the country's size shows its historic greenhouse gas emission. Notice how Europe is so big. I wonder what was going on over there. All right. Um, <laughs> so, you know, uh, one can point to the industrial uh, revolution and colonialism, pretty much. Um, now, this is what a world map will look like if the country size show its current um, greenhouse gas emissions. China and India economies grow rapidly recently. So that's why they're so big on a map because they're gonna, they have to consume a lot of fossil fuel gas to 
you know, develop, right? Now, this is what a map will look like. Uh, if the size of the country represents climate vulnerability, vulnerability, oh, that's a hard word to say. Um, you know, you can see that Asia is extremely vulnerable. And if you consider how little Southeast Asia contribute to the emissions, you can really see how climate change is not just an environmental problem, right? It's, it's also an injustice issue. This visualization is made in 2012, so we know a lot more since. But people in the global north are still richer and more capable of climate adaptation plan, planning than us. Um, by the way, when I said global north, I didn't mean the countries that are uh, above the equator, right? That's a, that's a common misconception. Global north represents the country that is disappearing from this map. For example, Australia, it's global north. Uh, and, and the reason we separate them is because the global north have contributed to majority of emission, but are less, are the least impacted by climate change compared to global south. So let's look at, let's zoom in, let's focus on the impact of climate change in a specific area. Now this map show the projected impact of sea level rise. So the blue area here show uh, the land that will be underwater if the global temperature increased by 1.5 degrees Celsius, which by the way, is what we agree on the Paris Agreement. So even if all the nation put in the effort, they promise Bangkok will still be underwater pretty much. Um, and the red area here is uh, it's the result of a three degree increase, uh, which is what scientists currently believe uh, will happen if we do not think about climate change. Now, sea level rise is not just a problem for Bangkokian, really. So the link here um, will take you to the whole map. And, um, and if you play around with the map, you will see that a lot of major cities in Southeast Asia, um, Yangon, Ho Chi Minh City, Phnom Penh, and Manila, they are all projected to be impacted by sea level rise. So let's take a few seconds again to really think, what can we do about this? Can you imagine a solution for this problem? Now, here's one solution. Um, this is a floating city. It is, is being constructed right now um, in Busan, South Korea, and it costs about $2 million. I have I've heard that uh, one is underway also in the Maldives too. Um, the floating city promised more land that are actually practically immune to sea level rise, right? Because it's literally sitting on water. So uh, no flood. Um, and they're supposed to be energy sustainable using solar and wave power. Really cool. Um, so a lot, it's a promise of new expansion, new economy, new colony. Or are we too optimistic about it? Um, to be clear, I'm not saying that floating cities are bad climate solution, uh, but there are reason to be skeptical about the idea of relying solely on the new technology to save the day right, without changing our action. Why? So first, when we say we have a new te technology, so to, uh, okay, when we say we have a new technological solution, we don't consider how long it takes to, uh, for the world to catch up on it. Um, does anyone here know when the solar panel was first invented? Um, Yeah, uh, I just looking at the chat, um, but 
I googled it. So it's in 1833, 190 years ago, we know that we can just get power from the sun for free. In 2020, renewable, renewable energy make up 14% of Southeast Asia energy production. So clearly it's take us a while to adapt new technology, right? Then we have to ask ourselves, are these futuristic solutions preferable or is it just a distraction because our government don't want to deal with transition from fossil fuel? It is also fair to ask if this will be a just transition. Um, how do we know that if Bangkok decide to build a flooding city, for example, the people who benefit from it will be those whose home are about to be underwater. I think that's a fair question to ask, right? Um, and the least reason, uh, the last reason to be skeptical uh, about, think about where you are and what you do right now, your way of life, your culture. If the solution of our future is mass migration, um, Will there be a space for our culture there? So the idea is that when you think about, uh, when you think of climate change as a big global event problem, big global level problem, many local cultures are about to be left out of the conversation. Now, let me give you an example that's quite personal to mine. So if you are able to, can you, uh, give me some reaction on the Zoom if you know what this dish is. And I'm looking at your boxes. No reaction so far. Well, um, this is called hit pot, a hit top. Uh, depend uh, depending on which region you are from in Thailand, um, you, you call them differently. For those of you who don't know, so this mushroom is named after the pop sound that it does when you bite into it. Uh, it has a strong exterior and a soft inside. It really is a, a delicacy uh, in the northern and not eastern part of Thailand. And I grew up with this every year uh, after the rainy season, we will get one, one of those and we'll eat them. They're delicious. Now I'm going to play a short video here to show you how it was foraged and I don't know if you can hear a sow but when we uh test run it the sow doesn't work out so I'm just going to milk the video so there are in the ground Yeah, and usually we put it, we boil them with spices. They're delicious. Again, um, so one thing to know about this mushroom is that it grows in the forest, right? And it relies on the amount of rain and humidity to form its fruit. Now, more and more, it become re very rare to find, and the price can be up to one thousand baht per kilogram Thai baht which is about 30 US dollars. For me, hip hop shows me how the people, their cuisine and nature are tightly connected. My people has been eating hip hop um, and we live near and by the place where it grows, right? People plus place equals culture. Um, without one or another, can this culture survive? Without the forest, people wouldn't have this mushroom. It is hard to cultivate this specific mushroom. And I, I've never heard of anyone who successfully and commercially grow this mushroom at home. And when you think about it, given how long we've been living with nature, impacting the ecosystem, I'm willing to bet that the relationship between us human and this mushroom it's a two-way relationship. It's not just us picking them up off, off the ground. It's also how we give back to the ecosystem that produces it. 
you know, whether we know it or not. Um, without the people tending the forest, the ecosystem might not longer be in the right condition to produce this mushroom anymore. And now a more important question, do you think I'll be able to find this mushroom in a floating city? When we talk about culture, we often think about the history and the arts, but how many times do we think about the food? Some food like this mushroom depends on the specificity of the ecosystem and that it cannot be replicated easily. So the most important part is that no one will, uh, the saddest part really, is that no one will know if, um, no one will know that this culture existed besides the mushroom forager. One day we will no longer eat hip hop and no one will realize that we have lost a fungus species and a very important culture. Now imagine that happened to the culture you hold dear. Uh, so I believe that climate, uh, climate crisis is a cultural problem. It's no longer, it's, it's, just, it's not just a big regional uh, or international problem. It, is, it can be area specific. You know, people in my hometown uh, of Nan will, and people in the Singapore will experience climate impact differently, right? And it's not just about the environment either. It's about our way of living because no matter how hard capitalism and supply chains makes us for guests, um, we depend on natural resources around us. It's not just a problem for the scientists or engineer. It's for all of us and our experiences matter. We can't rely on the government and the scientists to solve our problem without letting them know how significant these cultures are for us. Lastly, it's important to know that this is not just your responsibility to change. It is our responsibility as our responsibility to change as a culture. So now I hope that you are very familiar with this equation. Um, so climate change can threat our culture by one, displacing the people from the area, from the place, or two, impacting and changing the ecosystem of the place causing the people their way of life. Now let's re rewrite this equation so that instead of looking at the problem, we can see the solution. In my opinion, climate change is a cultural problem. Thus, it needs a cultural response. And to respond as a culture, we will need a collective people action and a place-based solution. You know, right? Um, sea level rise will mean something differently to those living in Bangkok than those living in Busan, South Korea. Floating city is simply not a one size fits all solution. We cannot wait for a technology to save us. We, might, we must take a matter into our own hands. And for this, we need collective people action. And who else has a, pro a power to bring people together? if not a cultural center, right? Cultural centers like yourself. Um, so I believe that people in this room are uh, has worked in the cultural centers um, one way or another. And if you have worked in those uh, spaces for a long time, uh, I think you're aware of the resources that you have and the tool that you have. You have spaces for gathering, you have very good communication skill. Um, you have the power within your institution to inform and educate the public, right? So if anything, something that I really want you to take away from this presentation is the last, the last row here. There is a lens through which we look at culture. If you're people who working in the um, in a dominant culture institutions like museum or university, um, you really need to listen to people who are from subordinate culture because those voices are usually left out. And if we don't pay attention to them, then we will forget some of the culture like um, hip hop, 
um, and then one day we will uh, we will lose that we will lose that culture without realizing it. So I want to leave you all with this quote right here. Um, and this is a quote from a social justice scholar, Bell Hooks. Um, Rarely, if ever, are any of us healed in isolation. Healing is an act of communion. So um, my call for action for all of you is to think about your role and to think about how you can drive the culture forward. Believe in your power. I believe in you. Um, uh, and, and I don't know how, uh, I don't know a beautiful way to end this presentation. So I'm just going to... Uh, I'm just gonna return the metaphoric, metaphorical microphone to whoever gonna uh, facilitate the round table. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. Um, that was wonderful. And yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I think that was a really fascinating presentation. And I'm happy that uh, for our first round table, we will now ask our roundtable members to share their responses and kickstart the discussion. And once they share, we will open all questions to the audience. Um, so we're going to start with Kun Chulamini. Can I ask you to start with your response? Uh, thank you very much, Amanda. Um, I follow Kun Purim's uh, presentation with much interest. Actually, it co coincides so much with what I, I plan to speak. My intervention will be based on two studies. The first one is my own studies made about 15 years ago. I made a study on 17 uh, cultural organizations with close relations with governments. The name, I, I think all of you heard about it, like Alliance Francaise, British Council, Goethe, Casa Asia, and so on. These organizations serve as non-government arms to promote better understanding and better relations between peoples of their own home countries and peoples of other countries that they are located in, which we can call home countries. One important finding is that in terms of activities, almost all of these organizations under study implement activities that promote arts, culture, language, and education of home countries. But when asked uh, what are their strategic thinking behind this, behind their activities, the survey revealed that this organization has given equal emphasis on both promoting the image of their home countries as well as on promoting dialogue with host country to solve problems and to create trust. Uh, so you can see that even in seemingly straightforward cultural activities like uh, language teaching, for example, dialogue can always be advanced to create trust and mutual understanding. And um, one specific issue of, uh, and, and sorry, and, um, at that time, the strategy of this organization had tendency to move from promoting awareness in the grander or in the civilization of home countries towards creating common understanding and find common endeavor in issues of specific of significant concern to humanity as a whole. And you guess what? What are the what are the specific what, what is the specific issue of common concern to humanity that have been discussed at that time? You guess is climate change. So even more than, I mean, a decade and a half ago, awareness has already been on the rise that by working on the issue of climate change, have potential to create trust and to bring people together despite the existing cultural gaps and political divide among countries. That is uh, what uh, my, my study at that time uh, showed. Then if we move to the second study, uh, is a, a study done by an Italian foundation, Fondazione Friscalaldo. The title of the study is Cultural Cooperation in Europe, What Role for Foundations? 
Although this study is not directly related to culture center and climate actions, but I find that the, the activities that they uh, uh, promote, uh, the different cultural center co promote at that time can be, is really relevant to what we are discussing today. The study find that cultural center could nurture innovation and serve as catalyst or incubate, incubator for process. That would not happen without its support. It could serve as change agent, in other words. Culture Center could also serve as international think tank by providing platform for debate in international issues of, com of, uh, uh, of common interest among diverse stakeholders. Culture Center could also support study and research through working with educational institute and research center. Cultural center could also promote intercultural contexts and multicultural activities, promoting dialogue among diverse cultural groups, including minority, uh, and opposing social exclusion. Cultural center can also serve, can also act as facilitator and intermediary linking diverse players together by creating conducive environment as a meeting point uh, among different players to develop and share experience on issue-based work. So from all what I mentioned so far, you can see that what we are doing here in CSHA is including this chat time, this session, we are, we are serving as a catalyst for change, we are serving as um, a platform where diverse uh, diverse players can meet and discuss, share best practice, and try to find solution. And this is what uh, I think cultural center can can do. Furthermore, in uh, promoting climate actions, uh, I will end my presentation my presentation uh, at this juncture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kunchalamini. Uh, for sharing about those two studies. That's very fascinating. And Del Momo, um, can I now ask you if you would share? Thank you, uh, speaker, Purim, and uh, also the uh, intervention of Kunchulamni. I agree uh, both of you because uh, I have been dealing with this, um, uh, I mean, brainstorming how culture play the role in fighting against uh, climate change challenges uh, for a few years now. And um, and uh, it is not much has been seen or accepted by the, the global community, especially those who are in the front row, especially like in the COP or the, the, the UNFCCC sponsor conference. So uh, that uh, our cultural community uh, have to continue working with this. So that direct um, solution, it's how that uh, our community, our uh, locals have been playing the role that we directly trying to reduce the carbon emission or the the less use of energy um, or fossil energy resources then the our cultural institutions role are that uh, to promote or to 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 apply by the each government in their policy uh how important these uh, local community, especially in maybe the tribal who are closest to the nature, who are the, uh, taking care of that uh, forest or the natural reserves and uh, staying uh, harmoniously with uh, nature and their way of life. So the, uh, I, I agree that uh, Konpurim say that the people and the places, people along with their cre creativity, 
for centuries their their faith and uh, their understanding with nature and the impact it's very important in in this regards and um and uh, that that should be that that should be taken into account as well as when when um when the government have to put in the climate action that's uh, the culture also play the role that people to accept to 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 share the, the common goal and understanding or to change something that's also culture act as the medium because if you don't understand that uh, each communities and uh, each places in uh, each areas their culture their way of practice their way of living then the uh it it will be very difficult to influence or very difficult to take them for um, active participation i think that's uh that's it's a part of uh the role that play by culture uh, apart from that, uh, the art and uh, other that influence on the people thinking and the, <clears throat> and the behavior changes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kunchu Del Momo, and Kunchu Mami for their uh, for their responses and for sharing. Um, I would now like to invite Dr. Isaac to share his responses as well. Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to Purim uh, for his uh, um, very uh, insightful uh, sharing of uh, of uh, on this topic, and of course Chulamani and uh, Moi Moi for uh, for um, sharing their thoughts on on this matter. I think uh, coming from uh, the Philippines, uh, as you know, in uh, the uh, Institute for Economics and Peace uh, came out with a Global Peace Index in uh, 2019. And the Philippines, according to this report, is the uh, country most vulnerable to the uh, impacts of climate change. Now, if you look at the top nine countries, there's Japan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, China, Indonesia, India, Vietnam, and Pakistan. Um, all of these are actually Asian countries. And um, the and of course you have ASEAN countries there as well. Four out of the nine are uh, in our region. Uh, if you look at other lists, it's uh, actually African countries. And what the point is is that uh, um, most of those that are vulnerable to climate change are actually countries in the global south. Um, and uh, that is uh, something that we need to address uh, when it comes especially to cultural heritage, we have to deal with that a lot because um, uh, we have a lot of, uh, I mean, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the ASEAN, uh, I mean, we, 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 I think we're the country which has to deal with uh, most of the natural disasters from typhoons to earthquakes, volcanic eruptions and flooding. So uh, many, many of our heritage sites are affected by that, and uh, which is why we need to incorporate um, a lot of uh, disaster resilience in our uh, cultural heritage uh, management. Uh, we've had to deal with uh, having to reconstruct many of these sites because of uh, natural disasters. And uh, one of the, the uh, many of those sites are actually damaged by uh, typhoons of course directly uh, related to all these uh, climate change issues so it's very important for uh, us in southeast asia to talk about uh, this topic uh, because we our region is one of those that will be most affected by um, the effects of climate change and i mean the studies have shown that uh, southeast asia is going to be one of the most uh, affected by climate change so i i am very happy that uh, sicha uh, will be uh, looking at or focusing on this topic for uh, quite some time. And uh, we I, I know that uh, we had a team that went to um, COP last year, and uh, we, we hope to um, continue raising the um, awareness on the uh, stake of culture uh, when it comes to uh, climate change. Uh, sometimes we are, um, we are um, left on the side uh, of climate change discussions because people don't see the uh, direct impact of uh, climate change on culture. Uh, 
um, especially our uh, indigenous communities. There is a lot of impact uh, on, on this. So uh, we hope to uh, uh, really raise uh, the voices of Southeast Asia. Uh, we really hope to raise the voice of culture uh, in uh, these discussions of uh, climate change. Thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, we will have uh, questions and answers from our uh, from our attendees as well. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Ivan. Um, yeah, on that note, I would like to thank our roundtable and thank Purim, as well as open up the conversation to the rest of the audience. So please feel free to raise your hand on Zoom, um, unmute yourself if you have a question, and you are welcome to ask questions both to the members of our roundtable, Dr. Ivan Kunshulamani and Dal Momao, as well as to Purim, our speaker. And members of the roundtable are will also be directing questions to Purim as well. Um, but yes, would anyone like to begin? I can start with a question myself that I've had. Um, I would love to ask Purim to start, but as well as members of our roundtable, if you have thoughts um, for the different cultural centers that we defined, um, I'm curious what some concrete tasks uh, we would say that they should prioritize to combat climate change and how this also might vary by cultural center. So from a museum versus a religious site, um, what are the ways that we might completely prioritize um, that climate change? Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Um, this is a very good question and it's, um, it's worth my dissertation my to be dissertation uh, because to be frank, I don't know the answer. I just think I, I just think that this is a very new thing that, that, at least from my understanding of the field literature, that museum, for example, start to think about how they could be, they could uh, be a shepherd of the culture toward change, um, toward climate action. Um, so it is hard to give you a concrete answer but in my past experience i have seen some museums step up and really engage in the topic for example there is a climate museum in new york uh usa who's uh which has a mission to educate people on climate change um there is a, a climate justice museum in Houston, Texas, which is very interesting. They're rather small, but they have done something directly with the community. They uh, And they have a very activist mindset, which I think is really refreshing, especially when you look at the museum uh, from its historical, uh, from its history, we know that museums tend to be more um, allied with the the colonial power so to see that a new museum taking on an activist role it's very impressing in, in, in yeah imp impressing um uh but to speak on a culture of the the worship places or a religious religious leader a religious places i think one thing that we don't discuss enough is how we rely on our spiritual is spirituality, right? We and, and that's how we build a sense of community. That's how we heal. That's how we um remain optimistic in face of a danger. So there's a lot of potential that we can tap into when we engage worship spaces into climate conversation. Uh, but right now my focus is on the community itself. Uh, I think they are at the for uh, forefront of action, uh, or at least they should be. If you want the, the action to directly address that problem and directly impact the communicate of uh, 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 impact the community, then these are 
very important actors that we have to involve. Uh, can I? Yes. Uh, I don't know when you talk about the culture center, of course, like us in um, uh, civil society, culture organization, as well as like uh, those working in the tourism industry. So that they also try to um, distribute or share the knowledge about the culture, local culture, about the local communities living, like a culinary uh, training, uh, sharing about the food, uh, the pro producing the food or saving the food, uh, the, the the habit, that that kind can be also be a part in this um, sharing culture. That's uh, a center, uh, but also making the, the business with the tourism things yeah thank you yeah. Okay, for those answers. do we have more questions in Trinamani? so you just unmuted yourself um actually i think that uh, uh climate uh, cultural sector is among those directly impacted by climate change. So the loss and damage that cultural sector suffered uh, should be the issue that the cultural sector side to raise awareness in the society that uh, what climate change uh, can impact their life. I mean, everyone talk about climate change, but uh, we just we just talk about it. <laughs> not so many people really do. Uh, not so many really do um, any act. I mean, concrete actions on that. So I think raising awareness is still an important role that cultural centers should still be uh, promoting. Raise awareness of people that climate change really impact their life and how and and trying to create space for people in the community to think what they should do uh, in their daily life even to to help adapting and mitigating uh, to climate change. Uh, I think this is an important role because a cultural center is very close to people and they, they, they have a role to play in creating this awareness and creating the uh, people realize the urgency to take action. Thank you. Might be able to share some example about the action by the religious institution, which is a, a Buddhist temple near my house. Um, they play a very active role in reading the community to um, uh, recycle the plastic. And I um, maybe I would like to share you an album of the photos that I took by myself. If it will be relevant. Uh, this is a very big um, temple that they have a very huge project of recycle and the temple adopt uh, the idea, the Buddhist philosophy of um, rebirth or uh, circularity. So they give the birth to the waste, uh, like use plastic and um, they become a center to receive all the used um, plastic bottle, um, paper. Um, this temple called Jat Dan, this is in Samut Prakan province. So uh, this temple, they adopted the idea of um, environmental um, preservation. And so um, by doing this way, um, it's help people in the community uh, that making more uh, with this temple and uh, keep coming and they uh, raise awareness of the whole community. I think that um, very impactful and a good example of um, uh, 
um, religious institution that help with the climate crisis. Yeah, <laughs> that is the thing that I just um, think of and I uh, can share immediately. And I think that the different um, religious institution can maybe think of the way that they can link um, the philosophy of the religion to help with the climate issue as well. And if my if I might react to um, your example, it's really mind blowing to think that um, a cultural institution think of the way to communicate um, the idea of recycle recycling through the philosophy of Buddhism, I think that is really amazing. And as an educator, I think of it in terms of uh, literacy almost, like how do we communicate to the community in the way that it's meaningful? And it's not just, you know, like a scientist or, or people from a big city coming to our community and say, you have to recycle like use the term recycle uh, like the english word recycle in a community that maybe the majority of people don't speak english then it lost the meaning and the significance but when you combine it with the belief that the, that community hold um tight in and personally connected to it and then you know like a lot of great action can come from that so this is a really amazing example thank you thank you yeah that that institution is communicating with people by action <laughs> yeah. um i also have a second because i wanted to ask thinking about the floating city and this is a question for the entirety of the round table, not just Purim, um, though Purim, of course, like, feel free to elaborate on it. Um, you know, the way that we say floating, you, you can't find uh, these mushrooms on the floating city. Um, when we say that, you know, I think about two things. The first, the first of which is, um, how do we, you know, have people maybe in this group seen, um, seen cultural heritage at odds with technological advancements before, um, you know, the act of preservation and technology can go hand in hand. Um, but even when going towards climate action, you know, have people seen that from at odds? And on the converse, um, do people have ideas about how they could work together? I can, I can take a first jab on that question, Amanda. Um, Again, um, really good question. Um, I think there is there are examples out there to show you that uh, not how culture and technology are at odds, but how when you try to solve thing, solve a problem using scientific method or a technology, um, there is an obvious power play that that you know that is in effect um um or or not even a not even in science in in society in general like uh, uh one example that i can give is if anyone remember the notre dame in paris burning down um it was a big news right it was big in the news people from all around the world pay attention to it this is like iconic architecture that is being destroyed by fire. Um, but at the same time, this year, um, a mosque in Gaza Strip, uh, which has a really long history, is being destroyed. And like, if if I ask people in this room, how many people have heard of that mosque being destroyed? Uh, I I don't think a lot of people will, will will know about it in the same way that they know about the Notre Dame being burned out, right? So two 
very significant cultural iconic buildings are uh, facing is destruction. Um, but all the attention in the world is paying to one building and not the other. So that is how, the, to me, that is very obvious how um, how long history of white supremacy and how political um, the how political action power has played into which culture we select to keep. It's almost like thinking from from the museum perspective. And if you are a curator, you can pick and choose which aspect of the story will you show in the exhibit, right? Um, and for the longest of time. When you go to the museum, the British Museum, for example, you see artifacts from culture outside of England as um, like this piece of um, exotic artifact that you can look at it, but you don't really learn a lot about it. Um, but when you look at like uh, Renaissance art, for example, you know who painted it, you know in details how it paint, you study it, and a lot of artists are inspired by it. So there's definitely a power um, balance there, right? Imbalance, I should say. Um, yeah, so, um, and I, uh, to your second question is asking about how culture and technology can work together. And I, don't know the answer to that question. So um, I'm just going to put it back to the round table and see if people react to it. <laughs> if I may. Oh, sorry. You, we have um, someone with a hand raised. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, yes, that's okay. Would you like to speak? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm operating off my cell phone. Um, hello from Washington, D.C. Um, listening to the conversation, so first of all, thank you for the presentation and all, all of the comments so far. Just want to respond to the question of how technology and culture can work together. Um, just for by way of background, my training is actually in economics, but I spent a lot of years in the museum sector. So I kind of see the world in a different way um, from a lot of my curatorial colleagues. Um, and the question that I tend to guide my work is about instead of how other things can impact culture, I ask a different question, which is how culture can be a tool to solve other problems. And I think by reframing that thinking, it, it is less about conservation or preservation but rather thinking about what do we know with either the culture itself or the, the process of museum or the knowledge we know about museum studies or museum education can actually feed back to other colleagues in the area like, you know, environmental problems or economic problems that can actually use what we know and practices in, we know and we practice in the cultural sector as part of the solution. So I just want to offer that as a, a way to kind of reframe how we think about whether technology and culture can coexist, because I don't think it's a zero sum game. It's actually two things that can actually work together if there is a goal of what we want to do with it. So thank you. Momo also wanted to say something, yes. Yes, uh, with the culture and technology, it's also like what uh, Chang just said. And uh, for us, uh, technology in this uh, digital era, and uh, everyone has access to that uh, social media. If we use it um, very, um, if we think from the beneficial side, it can also contribute a lot in the people in sharing the knowledges through social media. For example, it's, it, through social media, everyone can have access to someone is doing uh, exemplary, like uh, recycling 
or making the food waste into the the uh, the the plant uh, nutrients or 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 the awareness of the migrating birds because in in Myanmar those uh, migrating birds seasonal have been threatened because um, the people killed uh, for food or because they don't have the awareness uh, when. I mean, it can be also culture <laughs> to blame on because like on the vulture are, are the bad luck or the belief, traditional belief. So actually those vulture flew from the Northern hemisphere for the seasonal migrating when they have taken the rest in the, in the, in the special places, the high, uh, religious building, the people thought this is unlucky and threatened to kill. But uh, through social media and those, uh, the form formation of the new social groups, the people network through the media, they don't see each other. They can alert uh, someone in the area can go personally to stop that one and uh, raise awareness. Those kind of uh, good practices has been ongoing, or or the, trying to use the bicycle, that that kind of the social groups, uh, the youth groups or the the housewives group, how to cook, uh, by saving, uh, with a small amount of daily, uh, budget, how you can make a good uh, meal, that that kind of sharing among things might raise awareness and also altogether uh, the, the climate change impact. Thank you. Thank you very much, Momo. I see the hand of uh, Chidamani as well. Uh, please uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to, first I want to respond to Kun Teng's uh, intervention. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that is what we at CM Society and CSHA has been trying to uh, promote more interest in cultural wisdom and uh, as a tool to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Uh, this idea is just starting, uh, I mean, not, not just starting, sorry, it's just gaining momentum at the recent COP meeting. And um, UNESCO also start working to, to, to have to, to do research, to have more case study on how cultural wisdom could be used, could be used to for adaptation and mitigation of climate change. So we need to do more on, on this issue. So back to this question about the relations between culture and climate change, I mean technology and, and culture as a tool for climate actions. Um, we, we cannot deny that the world now is so much obsessed about using technology to as, as a tool to uh, mitigate and to adapt to climate change because simply because it's measurable. And of course, there's a lot of uh, 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 commercial interest in that as well. Uh, for developing countries uh, that have uh, limited access to technology, that would prove uh, to be difficult. But we, we need also to, to catch up with the technological uh, development to mitigate and adapt to climate change. At the same time, if we want to promote that culture can be used as tool, one tool in climate action. And if we want to create, uh, to uh, ensure credibility of our actions in in culture in in of our cultural actions as a way to uh, as climate actions we need to speak the language that uh, that have been used in climate change and technology for example we cannot simply claim that by using this architecture architectural style, uh, we can create net zero building without 
proper understanding what net zero means. It means a lot. It's not simply that if you don't use aircon, uh, that means that your building is uh, is the net zero. It is not that easy. But and if we still uh, go on uh, uh, promoting our idea using at liberty the word of net uh, net zero building, it it will not create credit. It will not uh, ensure credibility to what we have been. Uh, doing to promote culture as tool for climate action. I think cultural sector need to understand what, what people uh, are talking in climate change uh, uh, world and how when they use the technological technical words, what it means and how we can use that to help in our works in 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 cultural activities as climate actions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chulamani. I also see that uh, uh, we have a comment from uh, um, from uh, Eddie Suhartono. Maybe you would like to share something as well. You have a very interesting comment in our chat about yeah, uh, thank you. yes, Eddie. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm interested in the 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 discuss here that uh, organized by uh, Chatham, and I know uh, with I I'm friend of Jerion. <laughs> yeah, I'm from Indonesia, from Medan. Uh, actually, I have you know, I have concern about the climate change issue, but regarding uh, about the theme today i i understand about the culture not only uh, talk about people and place i said by the speaker <laughs> sorry mr purin be be because i am anthropologist so as as far as i know culture is uh, consists of three uh, i mean three uh, three uh, three men yeah the first is you know the idea and the second is activities, and uh, the third is the artifact. This is, I think, cover all of, of my activity related with the climate change issue. Uh, <clears throat> actually, uh, all of our activity is, you know, must be uh, <clears throat> focused in the in this the, the, this the, the three level. Uh, I have my organization uh, concern is not only intangible, but also tangible cultural heritage. So about the problem in climate change, I think it is not only uh, focus on the people and peace only, but also all of all of my life. Culture that I that I mean is uh, consists of the three Three, three issue yeah so the second uh, I said about the if we talk about the center building something like that but I think uh, more interesting about the you know like a task force the 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 center maybe the research center must uh, you know must serious uh, to to take to take part in uh in the activity there is a special task force to to run the issue about climate change it not only in the asian level but in the global level i know some of uh siaka team go to the dubai yeah in the last but i know there is a rally in there to again uh to about uh, climate change but i think we need at ASEAN level, for example, about the task force. This is real because many NGO like uh, in the I mean the Europe or in the other country only talk also talk about the uh, again climate change, but the really action in the any countries, for example, we have local wisdom here in in Medan or North Sumatra, maybe in Thai also. Uh, people have about the local wisdom. So the center, uh, I think this, the, the, the strategic role of the center, of the task force, or the task force is, 
you know, cover all of the activity uh, in each of the country. So this is the 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 I, I think the important of uh, the the important of the center. But I I have uh, you know uh, the center must be focused to run the you know uh, have a division about the serious uh, talk about the climate change in any country in Thai, in Indonesia, or in Malay also, in, in Asian level. So this is my comment in the, the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eddie. Actually, one of the things that uh, I think uh, CCHAC can look into is uh, to come up with uh, um, studies or um, materials that really um, um, document the effects of climate change, particularly to Southeast Asian culture. Um, we do know that there is an effect uh, for um, of climate change on culture, but uh, sometimes uh, it uh, it's uh, basically an idea that there is an effect and uh, there is actually no case study uh, being put forward. On, on those effects. So it's very important that uh, uh, we are able to um, really outline specific uh, examples of that. And I think this would be a good program for CICHA, especially if it wants to push for um, climate change um, action uh, with regard to the cultural sector. It has to be very clear or it has to be able to tell um, all these uh, decision makers, especially in the next COP, uh, as to what uh, specific effects we are feeling right now and why we want action uh, when it comes to climate change and uh, culture specifically. Um, are there any other points that uh, uh, people want to raise in the uh, in the um, audience? Or uh, our uh, panel? Or Purim, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I, I can feel that we are wrapping up this meeting. And I, I like to say, um, I'm just really uh, appreciate this opportunity to talk to everyone here and hear a lot of brilliant ideas. One thing that I want to leave you all with is um, something that I am plan to study, which is uh, the youth and their climate action. Um, and I think it's, there's, um, I can I can almost see the difference between how youth is taking action on climate change and how adult is taking cl uh, climate action and how there could be a, a gap between the two. Um, so in my work, in my own work, I'm looking for the way to link them. So like what, what intergenerational uh, activities that we can use to encourage youth and adult engagement for them to come together and um, engage in climate action. So um, th that's it. That's all I have. Like, uh, I just want to put it out there that um, because all of you have inspired me so much, um, I just think that there there's a way that we can you know, engage you in this conversation too. Thank you very much, Purim. Amanda, uh, what do we have? Uh, or are there any other comments that uh, people want to uh, raise? Um, it's like everyone's okay. quiet. Yeah, Amanda, <laughs> please go ahead. Yes, if there are no other comments from anyone, thank you, Dr. Ivan. Um, and thank you, of course, to, uh, again, to you, Kunchu Lamani, and Sal Momo for serving as the roundtable for him for the brilliant talk. Um, and yeah, I want to thank the audience as well for participating today and for the fascinating discussion. Um, and before we go, I want to share um, a few things. We firstly, we will announce the next episode of Chaw Time and other episodes of Chat Time throughout the year. 
So please follow the Southeast Asian Cultural Heritage Alliance, Sita, on Facebook and Instagram and subscribe to our newsletter. If you'd like to subscribe to our newsletter, you can do so through our website at sicha.org or email info at sicha.org, which I will drop in the chat. Um, I also, on behalf of Purim, sharing his uh, dissertation interests for his, um, his PhD, um, I'm going to share his email if you would like to reach out to him as well. Uh, though you can also, again, email info at sicha.org um, if you have any questions. Um, but yeah, I think that is about everything. Um, thank you all for being here today, and I hope to see you at our next chat time. Thank you all so much for an amazing uh, session and discussion. Thank you very much. See you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.